so I'm just going to talk about everything I've learned about startups and sort of open source over the past like five or six years. Um, like, so about me, five or six years ago, I quit my stable engineering job, went to graduate school, and then started a couple different startups. Um, started off doing a company called Site Machine, which did sort of analytics and data collection for um, factories, and that sort of um, turned into another startup job, which was um, a company called Tempo Automation, where we were building uh, pick and place machines for electronics. Um, and so in both of those cases, I kind of got to see um, you know, how you start with the premise of maybe making something open software or open hardware and meeting people in the community and then going from what you started with to actually a venture-backed startup. And I learned a lot of things uh, in that process. Um, the other, so I just want to make some caveats here. This is a sort of practical experience talk versus an academic heady, this is what open hardware should be. And so when I talk about these things, I'm not representing necessarily Oshawa or say my employer or anything like that. These are just sort of things that I've picked up a long way. And I have to be sort of necessarily um, vague sometimes about it with examples, but these are sort of lessons I've picked up along the way. Okay, so the first, first one realistically is uh, Everyone starts, they start building something, they have something interesting, they get people interested in it, they think they want to make a business, and the first rule of being a business is you are not a business if you don't make money, and you don't make a profit. And so you have to sort of, when you start a company to sort of encapsulate your open hardware, uh, you're going to have to make a business. Now there are some options. Things are changing. You can start and maintain being a cottage industry, and stay small and grow very organically, and that's fine. You can profit like this, this is good. Um, you can also decide maybe not to be a business. There are avenues, particularly in America, things are changing, where you don't have to be a business to have a way to finance and sort of uh, fund and motivate your development of your product. So in America, we have a new notion called um, a B corporation. And a B corporation is like a company like Etsy, where you, ha you can balance the needs of profit making with also your corporate responsibility and what you want to do. Um, there's also nonprofits, and I've seen nonprofits actually do some very, very interesting work in, in research. Um, I'm really, really fond of the Open Source Robotics Foundation. I've seen them make a lot of good hardware and a good software, and they pay a lot of good engineers, they do a lot of good work, and they're not motivated necessarily by this business logic. Um, we also have this expression in America where you can start your own company, but you can bootstrap. And this is this ridiculous American expression where you grab your boots, the, the, the ends of your boots and you pull yourself up and you bring your company up with nothing. It's as ridiculous as it sounds. Okay, so everything I've seen right now, at least in, in San Francisco and I've seen things in New York and Boston is that there are effectively two types of startups. There are startups who use open source and can anyone guess at the second? They're liars. <laughs> is everything I have seen so far is that when you are small, when you are scrappy, when you are having to build a, a, a huge amount of work in a short amount of time, there is no way to do it besides using open source. And a lot of it's BSD and that's fine. That's what it's created for. Um, but it makes you wonder like why, why are there not more open source businesses building more open source products? And the first one is, the sort of first thing I sort of noticed is that Consistently, when somebody starts out with an open source product, they, they conflate this notion of their fans, their friends, the people they meet at these sort of summits with the customers that are actually going to pay them and make a valid business. And this is generally not actually what happens. You have fans that are very, very interested in the fact that you are open hardware, and then you have customers, which generally don't care about open hardware, they just want a problem solved. That is to say, most people don't really care about open hardware. I'm, really sad to say that, but that is the, the truth. We all care about it. Everyone here, I think, cares about it. Um, the one thing people do seem to care about, and we've noticed this, is the magnitude and direction upon which you go open or closed. So MakerBot started in this world where it was 100% open and went slightly closed, and it was a horrible, horrible thing. Where somebody like Microsoft starts all closed and slowly starts opening things up, where MakerBot may be more open than Microsoft, we react differently. And that's something I don't have any thoughts on. It is just the nature of the world. So if I had the option of being completely open 
and then having to sort of retract something based on a business logic, or because sometimes you don't have the whole business planned out, it's it could be very very scary. Versus the other side of it, where I stay completely closed, but oh, I can open things up slowly uh, at my leisure. It's a lot safer position. So that's so people sort of default to being closed because of this scarce, you know, people being scared of having to take this little bit away for business practices. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's sort of the nature of the animal. Um, so if our customers don't care and we get in trouble if we, if we do things in the wrong way, how do we make the case for doing more open source as businesses and sort of in these larger venture-backed businesses? And how do we keep our sort of morals and ethics intact with all of that? And the real answer is that you make a strong business case for using open source hardware. Um, so how do you do that? And so you have to come up with like a, so, and what I've found is, and the only thing I can think of is that you need a strategic advantage that is given to you by having open hardware. So the first reason I've heard against having open hardware is that it allows everyone to see exactly what your company is made of. There are thousands of venture-backed startups now that are claiming to have some incredible proprietary machine learning who are all probably using the same open source packages. But if they were to open source everything, you could see that they aren't this giant puffer fish. They're actually quite tiny. And so it is a way of making yourself look bigger and badder. And I don't know if that's necessarily the case. So this is, a, this is something that you will hear from a business standpoint of, hey, don't open source, because then people will know that you're kind of not really full of any actual technical interest. Um, so another thing I hear often in, um, for startups is, what do you guys think is more important for an early stage startup? Is it being stealthy and not allowing anyone to know what you're working on and not allowing you to get customers? Or is it more important to show traction and that you're building something that people actually want to buy? What do you, come on, interact. What do you guys think? Is it A or is it B? All right, if no, it's, it's actually A. It's actually showing traction. If you can show that people are interested in what you're doing, if you have competitors, it is a competitive market that validates what you are doing. And this gets me to the second point um, that I have, is if people are trying to clone what you're doing and are interested, and even if it is open source and they're stealing your designs, that means you're doing something that people are very, very interested in and people are willing to pay for. Um, generally, in a competitive market, it's more important to execute well and actually scratch all those itches that the customers want from you than to just have a good idea. A good idea is not worth anything until you actually do it. So how do you go and execute things well? You get the best engineers, and the best engineers generally love open source. Um, I've heard myths, actually, from venture capitalists that most of them sometimes think that open source is amateur hour, because they look around, they see a bunch of sort of scrabbled, dirty, hairy engineers in a room drinking cola, you know, wiring stuff together. And, and they think it's sort of amateur hour. And the, the truth is, um, open source actually runs the world. You just have this weird distribution of how it's done. There are a bajillion uh, open source, like, to commit repositories out there and dead projects. But there are also a lot of a minority of open source projects with, you know, tens of thousands of commits you know, hundreds of dedicated developers, and those things are actually some of the most robust, useful projects in the world. It's basically this power law of contributions. The very minority of repositories get the most contributors. Um, and also, as an engineer coming into a new startup and evaluating different things to work on, having an open source platform to work on de-risks me, because I know if that start word goes belly up, or I want to leave, or whatever, I know that that body of work is actually transferable. I can go to my next job and point to that body of work and say, I built this. I can leave that job and say, fork you, I'm gonna go build my own thing. I'm significantly de-risked in what I'm doing. And so the other way you kind of sell this in Silicon Valley, at least that I've been able to figure out, is that there's this phrase called company culture that everyone likes to talk about, but no one can actually define. So if you create an open culture, you hire to that, you find those sorts of people. Um, and the NBCs love this thing. They love having ecosystems and platforms and marketplaces. And when you create an open system, you can generally generate that sort of interest and traffic very early on, as long as you sort of frame it right when you're discussing things with them. 
And so the last little bit that I have here, um, and I know this is sort of scattered, is as you start doing this and you have the discussions with your partners, you may, you know, maybe at like something like a Maker Faire or an event like this or just at a hackerspace, as you start talking about your, your plans for openness or where you're going to go with it, make sure you sort of codify those things and keep a paper trail and have a way of actually getting back to where you guys wanted to be. And so, so that's what I've got. Um, if you guys have some questions, I'd love to answer them. So are there any questions from the audience? Um, I might let you think about it for a while and um, ask you a question myself. Like, you, you mentioned that there is this myth about how open source is always kind of amateur and mm -hmm. it is kind of related to developers don't, I don't know, looking super clean and drinking cola or something? Well, it's not, it's not <laughs> just that, like in the mind of like a, a professional, right, they see plywood and they think, oh, it's slapped together. Well, plywood is your prototyping step before you actually go and get something professionally machined. But they don't see that leap. And you, you, they don't see the fact that prototyping with wires and having you know, breadboards is this step in going to get a PCB actually finished. And they don't understand the, the creative process that goes through it. So things look very amateurous very early on. Yeah, but that's kind of like a necessity for open up a project, right? To, yeah. to ha have that kind of character to begin with and well, I think it's mature almost into something else. So it's kind of like, I guess the question I want to ask is like, how can we tackle this issue and, and kind of get rid of this myth? Well, that the, the understanding that you'll be confronted with somebody saying this myth is very, very helpful. Because I, in, I think one of the strongest things I've learned in this whole process is people have so much fear. Like, they're, they're scared that they won't be successful, that they won't be able to find funding. And it's actually not that. If you're not fearful, if, somebody, if you're fearful and somebody says, hey, I think you're kind of amateur hour, well, then you sort of internalize that and you say, oh, okay. But if you say, no, I'm not. I've done the same sort of process before in multiple projects. And it usually works out. And you counteract that very strongly and emphatically and correctly, it, it, you can deal with it well. Yeah, I see what you mean. Oh, here is another yeah. question popping up. Uh, what is your experience in the United States with investors and open hardware businesses? It's still like it's news or it's interesting, but if you don't protect the IP and if you kind of release everything for free, it's not a business model. Is that still the case or is that kind of more accessible by now? Well, there's, so there's a, you know, tens of thousands of investors out there. And so some of them are more, ad like some of them are engineers, right? It was surprisingly, some of us could be in this position where we do really well and we are actually funding these things. And so they, they do understand this, right? And some of them just don't. Some of them come from a business world or a like marketing world where there's the thinnest veil of technology and it must be proprietary. And so it, part of the process is just shaking so many hands that you find the right people who understand that. All right, any further questions? Uh, questions, <laughs> questions, sorry about that. Um. So you, uh, you talked about different forms of corporations, organizations there. Mm -hmm. There's actually one that you didn't mention that I find pretty interesting, mm -hmm. uh, which I saw in the US as well uh, with, with Mozilla. Uh, and that might be interesting in perspective for others as well, which is a nonprofit foundation. Mm -hmm. that, and that's how it was founded, as a nonprofit, because it's that's, that's how, the, um, the philosophy. But it has a wholly owned subsidiary that is a for-profit. Uh. And that for-profit can make money, can do the, the stuff that makes profit but at the same time is bound by the nonprofit mission or by the mission of the nonprofit. So it's, we ended up, or Mitchell Baker, our, our chairwoman, ended up calling it a hybrid organization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and it's a pretty interesting form of being able to, to make profit even though you're bound by the mission of a nonprofit. Yeah, to firewall things off. Yeah. And I, I am not a business lawyer, I am an engineer who sometimes tries and to run stuff. And you cannot be sold or anything like that, which sometimes makes uh, customers think twice. <laughs> 
So uh, you said that you made uh, some, you started startups, and I just wondered how did they all end? Did you sell them, or did you give them in the hands of other people? Or are you still the owner? I, I, I've left two of them actually. So they're they're out, they're doing their thing. It's just I'm no longer there. I went on to the next thing because I disagree with something, or we just parted ways. And that is sort of the nature of the animal. Hi, thank you for the talk. Mm -hmm. I was just like thinking that maybe like some some projects like start open source and like maybe some engineers see a need that will arise later in the future, or there's like a I don't know, in the beginning is like a small group of people who like who like need it, but they have a vision. I don't know in the Internet of Things that's going to grow and the marketplace is, is going to grow, but like the the money should be like a neutral proof of that that you're adding value to people's lives. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's 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 you know sometimes the people don't know what they want until you show them. Yeah. So it's, so it's like uh, like I find like this this phase it's like it's like it's like the tough one, like where it's hard to provide like tangible value for people that are like you said that they are ready like to pay for it although you already have you know a vision. That's or, that's know. the bootstrapping phase. No one you know there's a generally a phase where you know, you do something and you think it's really important and your friends who know a lot about it think it's really important but everyone else thinks you're crazy and you have to be willing to be a little bit crazy and sometimes the investors sort of lag on that craziness and you know, that is sort of the bootstrapping phase and that's, as one professor I used to have described it, that's when you're sleeping on the floor and eating boiled newspaper to get things yeah. done. I was, I was just thinking, do you have maybe like any advice like, you know, because I think it's, it's important also to know how to I don't know, play on the human nature of things, like you need to like play the game a bit, like to present your product well and like, you know, uh, I don't know, like, like provide like a really clear definition of value. So it's like, it's... Uh, well, there's, a, you know, there's a, there's a huge world between, you know, raising $10 million or $5 million and raising something that's smaller. Uh, lately, I used to be a, a defense contractor, actually. I, you know, Government-sponsored research funding, I, I've seen it work really, really well, actually, for open hardware startups to get off the ground. I, like the one that comes to mind is like Backyard Brains. They've done a really good job of that. And that's a model that I kind of learned early on, but I haven't used in starting a company yet in, in the sense of, you know, you, you get this ball of funding and it is sufficient to keep you going at a, at a reasonable pace with, 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 you know, other people and be able to afford materials for a period of time until you can actually get to a product that is sound enough that people are willing to pay for it. All right, any further questions? If not, we will thank you, Kat, for this mm -hmm. amazing talk, um, introducing us to the idea of startups and open hardware. Thank you very much. Yeah.